Is this working? Is this is working. <clears throat> check, check. Mic check. One, two, one, two, one, two. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me at uh, Boston Tech Poetics. When Coven first invited me to come speak, um, I was like, hell yeah. Uh, I use technology and poetics in my artwork, I like to think. But really, when I was thinking about um, you know, how it is that technology functions in my artwork, uh, I, really, I had to reframe a lot of um, the work that I have done. So I'm just going to go through some of my feelings. Um, first off, this is me. Uh, I'm Victoria Shen, I'm from San Francisco, um, but I've been living and working here for the last eight years <laughs> as, uh, as an artist. Um, but uh, when you tell people you're an artist, they ask you, you know, what kind of art do you make? Uh, and they expect an answer to be some kind of medium, but you know, it's really hard for me to define my body of work by medium because I do painting, I've done scenes, I've done uh, net art, and uh, I've done nail art, and this is the piece that Coven was talking about earlier. Um, so I'd much rather prefer to be defined by the kind of themes and subjects that pervade my body of work and let the, the medium follow that. Uh, so these are some of the, th the themes that are most important to me in my work. The formation of identity, sexuality, fantasy. Um, and all three of these themes have been profoundly influenced by technology in the last well, in the recent years, let's we'll say. Um, so in my work, what I really want to do is ask these questions of how technology predicts and determines your identity, how it modifies our sexuality, and how it changes the kind of fantasy space that we uh, inhabit. And also, generally, what is the overall role of technology in shaping of our consciousness? Uh, and that, of course, um, versus the role of art in shaping our consciousness I want to look at how they both function in our society, the forms that they take, and their ultimate goals. And it's my argument that their ultimate goals are kind of at odds with each other. So first off, let's look at technology. Why do we love technology? Technology makes our lives easier, more comfortable, simpler. Uh, there's increased mobility, increased speed. Uh, we have instant answers and instant gratification just at our fingertips. But how is art different, or at least, in my opinion, good or important art? Um, art can be confusing and difficult to identify. This is Marcel Duchamp. Would you know this is art? It's now canonized as um, what, some of the first avant-garde art. This is Piss Christ by uh, Andre Serrano. Art can be offensive. Art can be impractical and difficult to navigate. And uh, it can be frustrating because there's no clear meaning or uh, immediate points. It's open-ended. Um, <laughs> so, um, in my own work, I use technology in the service of art, right? But what does it mean to do that, especially if their ultimate goals are opposed to each other? And uh, you know, I have to use technology in my work if I want to enact a rigorous mining of these kinds of topics. And I need to use tech in order to, to pose these kinds of questions about like sexuality and identity and those things that I posed to you earlier, and to figure out the way technology works on us. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you two kind of branches of my work. Uh, one is moving image or video, and the other branch is sound. Uh, the moving image is a much more pointed kind of critique of you know the, the goal and mission of technology, or at least the way it works on us. And sound is a little bit more optimistic. Uh, it's like my contention that uh, sound is a possible al alternative uh, to like the passive kind of surrender to the seduction of technology. Um, so I'll um, elaborate on that in a little bit. Uh, so video. Uh, this piece is called Spectacular Visions. Uh, it has a pretty monumental scale. Uh, it was shown at Fourth Wall Gallery. What you're looking at is um, 12 monitors, uh, LCD monitors, that are showing on loop uh, video that was pre-recorded using maximum speed, and uh, a projection up here that you can interact with using this console that's driven by an Arduino board. Um, so <laughs> the, the aesthetic and the construction of this piece was influenced by the story that my uncle told me. He was in the military in Afghanistan, 
And he was in intelligence and he was describing his workplace to me and he was telling me that uh, whenever he would look up from his screen, all he would see was a sea, an ocean of screens also. And it was sort of uh, surreal and dystopian to him and it, his description was definitely dystopian to me too. But you know, I was trying to extrapolate, if this is what things look like now, what would they look like in the future? And I had this vision of you know, just like a vector of screens, these just a bunch of screens overlaid on top of each other that are transparent so you could see multiple images at once. And I kind of want, I wanted to realize this, this image and in order to do so I used uh, this programming uh, language Maximus P to create this palimpsest effect. Um, so I can just show you what it looks like. Um, let's see. I forgot. <laughs> I did get my controller. Sorry, I have a lot of demos, so. Uh, with uh, the Arduino, you could control the dimensions of the piece and the transparency, so, oh yeah. effects you can get with it. Uh, you can also do this thing because um, it's communicating with OpenGL, which is uh, the graphics card language. Let's see here. Is it doing it? You get these uh, really jittery effects too if you want to. But anyway, that's a fun toy to play with, but uh, for the piece that um, in spectacular visions, it unfortunately is not so fun to play with because the kind of imagery, uh, the imagery that I was using was um, half of it was a drone strike, drone strike footage taken from drones, and the other half was CGI snuff pornography. And <laughs> it's important that these two kinds of images are juxtaposed with each other for me because. The, the drone footage is you know, a depiction of a very traumatic and violent kind of uh, event that is happening in reality. However, it's being represented in the most sterile, streamlined, and remote way possible. And the CGI pornography is, you know, it's violent, it elicits a very um, strong visceral emotional response, at least for me. Um, and uh, it's, it's jarring, but it's completely fabricated. It's made on a computer, it doesn't exist in real life, but it has, of course, this emotional response that comes with it. And uh, for me, this, this aesthetic uh, makes it so that you see bits and pieces of each image at the same time, and you never get to see each one separately. Um, let's see, and uh, it's impossible to resolve the image one from the other uh, in the flatness, but also within you know these conflicting concepts that they contain of remoteness, but reality and like, intimacy, but it's virtually manufactured. Um, let's see, and this, this piece is a commentary on I think how technology can work on us to create or close distances between us and objects of representation. Because it has this power of manipulation, uh, it can render important real-world things as being banal and banal things that have no bearing on real life as being of the utmost importance. And I think you know a lot of social media platforms kind of perpetuate this sort of process, like Instagram and Tumblr, these things that um, just view you images based on your your interests, like how they identify you. And you know there's this idea where you are what you see, and so the kind of images that you consume and like put back up on social media are the things that you you know, that compose your, your inner subjectivity. Uh, let's see. 
Um, anyway, so I, I think like the, the dark side of this kind of technology is that it would push us further out of touch with reality. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, all of these things are operating on a visual plane. Um, uh, it it de dematerializes our experiences, like our experiences are just what we see on a screen in front of our eyes, whether it's our phone or in a theater, and um, the rest of your body just becomes kind of unimportant. Uh, so I would propose that sound is an alternative way for you to engage with, um, with technology, because sound is the a very physical medium, even if it's invisible, it is the modulation of the density of particles in the air. And you know, your ears are the things that the organs that evolve to kind of like sense these changes, but your body also engages with it too. If anyone's ever gone to like a loud concert, you know that feeling of sound catching in your chest, and it's a bodily sensation that makes you aware of your body and also where your body is in space. Um, so I perform in an experimental noise group called Trim. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to play a little like two minute clip of what uh, our performances sound like. Oh, oh shit, I need sound. No sound, right? That's closer than Yeah. Uh, it should go through HDMI, right? Oh, can you choose the sound card? Uh, can you select the output some punk ass speakers, but when we perform, we use like a big ass bass amp, so just saying. Uh, you know, I try to keep this in mind, uh, the experience of like being engulfed and uh, enveloped in sound, and it's something that I, I think, uh, I, or I hope keeps people in the present and in space. Uh, and also what you just heard, you know, if you've heard it at all, it's quiet, but um, it is irreproducible because that's just the nature of the electronics and the instruments that I use. I use uh, analog synthesizers for these agents of chaos that were designed by uh, artist and engineer extraordinaire Jessica Ryland. Uh, so these synthesizers are just basically taking uh, small electronic parts and then um, routing electricity through them to solve mathematical functions and the, the resulting output is just sound. Uh, and her sensor are designed to be patchable, so kind of like the Max patches. Uh, this is my score. This is the, the closest way that I can re recreate sound. Uh, this, this patch is called Batchet. So. Uh, yeah, this is the Jealous Heart. Um, so the really cool thing about patchable synths is that uh, when you take an output and you uh, send it through a filter, you can take the output of the filter and send it back into the oscillator or back into the filter and you get these really very complex sounds out of very simple parts. Um, and because uh, they were built with, with chaos in mind, chaos theory is a field of mathematics that um, originally was used for uh, population tracking, but it's now uh, like again, a field of mathematics where the parameters of the initial conditions are incredibly sensitive to minuscule changes. So it's close to impossible to always like recreate exactly the kind of sound that you have. And this is the kind of, um, this is a picture of what a mathematical function solving a chaotic equation looks like. And uh, I kind of want to show you what, what it looks like in action using the synth of the oscilloscope. So if you bear with me, I can set, hook it up.
And then maybe I can show you what it looks like on the gel's heart, the smaller synth. Uh, let's see here. demonstration of some Lorenz attractors. Um, <laughs> all right. So, okay. Um, oh, yeah, maybe I should do this. Okay, so why do I think this is important? Why do I think it's reductive of technology? I think you know, what I alluded to before is that this is kind of a liberation of the hegemony of vision because everything, you know, that is important to us takes place, right, in our eyeballs these days. But, um, you know, when we make a, when we do a performance, it's highly localized, both in space and time. Like, you're never going to see it again, and you have to be within kind of, you know, the, the epicenter range in order to experience it. And I do want to draw a distinction between sound and music because music, acts like a text because um, you can place music in general in a genre or um, within a culture or within you know a time and a place and so therefore you can read it as a text and impose meaning onto it and the importance of you know the synth stuff to me is that it's a kind of form without meaning um, it's a sort of formalism it's uh, challenging and it's disquieting because you don't know what the, the cultural historic reference is. Um, there's no discernible time signature, there's no discernible melody, so how it's a challenge to figure out how you can enjoy something that is so kind of painful and noisy. Uh, and you know, I think this is like a kind of countering of the instrumentalization of tech because there is no immediate apparent reason. Should you enjoy it? You know, it's a question like, am I enjoying this experience right now? What should I make of it? Um, and uh, why do I subject the people to, to noise? Why do I subject them to blurry, violent images? And I think, you know, there's this, this lack of control, there's this, um, there's a state you have to put yourself in to leave yourself open to seeing some kind of beauty and, you know, these juxtapositions, these poetic readings. Um, also, uh, it's a poetic use of technology as a form of self-negation. This tech is being used to kind of criticize itself, and that's what I think, and that's a sort of poetic function for me. And, you know, passivity is easy, and passivity is pervasive because it's easy. Um, and I think that art is one way that you can capture this kind of, like, lotus eater syndrome, where you're just, you know, so involved with yourself, it, it, you run the risk of being solipsistic, and also it, it leads to the decay of, like, critical thinking, I think. Um, but uh, I believe that if people do continue to, to struggle and push themselves to confront these uncomfortable, uh, almost like painful experiences, then you can push through and then experience a form of pleasure or stimulation of a higher order than what the easy pleasures of technology can afford to you, such as Netflix and chill. Uh, that's my talk, thank you. Right. Do I take questions now, or do I wait till the end? Yeah. 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 Take questions. Okay. Questions. How does your uh, how your devices have like rhythm or tempo? Like, is uh, there a there's a, an oscillator. So you there's a sawtooth oscillators or LFOs that uh, change the electricity and modulates the, tech, uh, the the electricity in a rhythmic way. So you change the frequency and that changes the pitch. They're, they're the same thing. 
What, what was the oscilloscope graphing? Oh, this, the oscilloscope is on XY mode, and so I'm taking two points and measuring them. Uh, so if you look at like a sine and a cosine, and if you put them uh, perpendicular to each other, you'll just get a circle. So it's just measuring kind of the electricity um, from two different kind of reference points that aren't X and Y, normally like time over voltage. Yes. Any reason why the Lorentz factor has to be any reason? Uh, because it's the it's the prime example of chaos theory. When you think of chaos theory, you immediately think of the Lorenz attractor, which looks like a butterfly, which is why they call it the butterfly effect. If you didn't know that. Um, anything else? Yes. Hi. Um, so, when uh, in your musical endeavors, do you do you follow more of like an experimental approach to songcraft? You actually you actually go for like the verse, chorus, verse kind of. Oh no, it's totally experimental because I have like no formal training in music at all, if that isn't apparent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's like, any, like if you try to go for like a form or something. With, oh no. Like with experimentation, that makes any sense. Oh yeah, I guess t sometimes when I've jammed with people, I've, I've tried to like, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. I've tried to like get into a kind of like 4 4 rhythm sometimes when they want a traditional um, song structure. <clears throat> Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, okay, one more. Sorry. You're going to see you play. Where? Uh, next time, where are we playing, Dana? Well, we're going to, so this is kind of illegal, but we're going to be playing in some bear cages soon uh, on 420. And then, <laughs> and then three days later, we're going to be playing at this, uh, at the Elks Lodge in Cambridge for this um, big festival called Wicked Mess. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. I'm just, yeah, I'm just curious where you, you see your art going, and if you want to see more visual or, or um, more experimental, experimental with the audio. And, yeah, um, honestly, uh, it's it's been mostly audio now, and you know, I I'm trained as a visual artist, and I used to make a lot of visual art, but since I've taken you know music making and uh, performance more seriously. I haven't even like had like the urge to like draw anything. It's really bizarre. I think you just channel your energy in one direction or another. At least in my case. Yes. Are you playing at the abandoned bear cage? Yeah, that's those are the bear cages. It's in Roxbury, right? Is it? Yeah, I guess so. The Roxbury JP. Yeah, Franklin Park. Right Franklin Park. Park. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure how it was supposed to be on the base, so. Yes. <laughs> so I'll see you guys there. <laughs>